morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It is good to gather with you on this lovely summer day as we continue through the Old Testament uh, for a while. Uh, today we're going to hear a story from Exodus about the, the Pharaoh and the midwives, um, the story that leads up to Moses, but we're not going to get to Moses. So. Uh, everything that you need for worship is in your bulletin including the words to the songs, but if you need the music to sing along with, uh, the hymnal is under your seat. And if you're joining us from home, whether you're live or replaying, um, we're glad to have you um, joining us for worship. And the bulletin can be found at www.ctvelca.org. Uh, and so we welcome you to, to put a pause on, and you can go get that and come back. So you can follow along and participate at home. To do that. I don't think I have any other worship announcements, um, so I invite you to take a moment with me to center your hearts and your minds and kind of ground your body in this space so that we can be more fully open uh, to what the Spirit has to say to us this day. So we take that silence together. And now I invite you to stand as you are able and as it is comfortable for you to do that. And we will confess our sins and hear God's words of forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting in God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. And we sing our gathering song, which is going to be your Lord.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord of the vulnerable, you made Shifra and Pua defiantly bold in the face of violent oppression. Give us eyes to see systems of subjugation in the world around us and empower us to act on behalf of the vulnerable. Amen. And we sing our acclamation for all the faithful women. be to God. Now, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Kind of sets the stage, right? The backstory, of course, is that Joseph, Jacob's boy, you remember him, the one who was the favored of his father, who aroused the jealousy of his brothers, was sold into slavery by those same brothers, and was eventually taken to Egypt, where he rose after lots of intervening years 
to become the Pharaoh's right hand man, in charge of everything, because he was unable to he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams about the years of plenty and the following years of famine. And so the Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of storing up grain during those feasting years so that they would be prepared when the famine came, so that there would be enough for the Egyptians and more. And Joseph, whose brothers thought he was long dead and had told their dad that he was gone, came asking for grain, not knowing, not recognizing their brother. And there's this whole reunion, and ultimately the whole extended family comes. There were 70 of them at that point, the Bible tells us, at the end of Genesis. They came from Canaan to Egypt. They were welcomed by the Pharaoh. They were given their own section of Egypt to live in, and there they lived happily ever after. Those brothers and Joseph, that is, that generation. But eventually they all died off, and so many years have passed. But the descendants are still there. They never went back to Canaan. Why would they leave? And the family tree has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And a new king, which is kind of, you know, like a the author of the Bible is kind of given a little dig at the Pharaoh, because there are plenty of kings, but only one Pharaoh who is the son of the sun god Ra. So to call him a king is like a little subtle insult. The new king has come to rule, and he does not know or remember the story of who Joseph was and what Joseph had done for his country and how the Hebrews had come to live in the land at all. All this new king sees are non-Egyptians. Taking up the land, living in Egypt, just their existence there was a threat to him. The story doesn't tell us that they have done anything to make the Pharaoh think that they, he should be afraid of them, that they will rise up if war comes and they will side with the enemies and escape from the land. Apparently there's some value to them being there. He doesn't want them to leave, but he doesn't want them to rise to power, so he hatches this plan. He says, come, let us deal shrewdly. Let's oppress them. Let's make them work so hard that come the end of the day, they're too tired to think about any extracurricular activities that would extend and multiply their families. And just go to bed and go to sleep. And so he conscripts them into forced labor, building cities, working with mortar and bricks and out in the fields. And it says twice, they were ruthless in imposing tasks on them. But that doesn't work, right? They still keep having babies. They, be, they continue to grow more numerous. And so he takes it a step further and he calls the midwives and tells them, when you go and a boy baby is born, kill him. But you can let the girl babies live because, you know, the girls aren't too much of a threat. The boys, they'll grow up to be men who pose a danger to me. And we will come back to the midwives, but for now, we see that when the midwives don't comply, then the pharaoh takes it up another notch, right? This is what happens. Violence begets violence. And he commands all of his people. Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile. As a person, as a parent, as a human being, it hurts my heart to imagine that scenario. I imagine it does yours too. The Bible doesn't tell us if the people of Egypt actually went through with it. It's not hard to imagine, though, that they might have, right? That the Pharaoh might have stirred up so much anxiety and hatred towards this other people that they would do what he said without a second thought. And it's not hard to imagine because history is filled with this type of scenario, not people throwing babies into rivers, but certainly people taking advantage of and harming the weak and vulnerable where a person or a people 
with power starts to view other groups as a threat and finds themselves consumed by that fear and that fear as it so often does translates into anger and that anger leads to policies to keep those people down to make their lives harder to ensure that they will be too tired and beat down that they won't somehow rise up and take over rebel they do it in big ways sometimes and sometimes little by little like you know raising the temperature of the boiling of the water till it's boiling and the frog you know finally realizes too late that they should jump out Germany under Hitler certainly comes to mind as a place where this happened. And, and we sit and wonder, well, how did those people go along with that? That's what I wonder about the Egyptians, too, what they did. Rwanda in 1994 with the genocide, attempted genocide of the Tutsi by the Hutu. In modern day Earth, China has re education camps for Uyghurs are a group of people who are Muslim and of some other slightly different ethnic background than the, the true Chinese. Re-education is kind of code word more for concentration camp. And we say over and over and ever again, and it's easy to point the finger, unless we think that it's just other countries where that type of oppression happens. You remember that there were Japanese internment camps in the United States during World War II. We round them all up and put them in camps because they posed a threat. Back in the early 1800s, there was a law passed to assimilate and civilize the Indians. And so you have all heard, I'm sure, stories coming out of Canada, but also in the United States of native born and indigenous children separated from their families, sent to boarding schools with their hair cut short and not allowed to speak their native language, traditional clothing traded for uniforms so that they would assimilate and become more like us. And we've heard the trauma and the terror of some of those places. The recent shooting in Buffalo just last month was itself racially motivated, connected with the Great Replacement Theory. I imagine you've heard of that. It's the idea that our country is being taken over by people who don't look like us. People of different races and ethnicities and religions. Chanting, you will not replace us. Not in that shooting, but at a different rally a few years ago. There's all of this. <gasps> Those people, they're going to take over, over and over and over, here and in other places around the world. And when we look at that history, it makes us uncomfortable and anxious and angry because we don't want to see and recognize all of the way that that fear of the other rises up within people throughout humanity's history, within our own history. The ways that those in power and sometimes just sub-fringe groups seek to exacerbate that fear and turn us against one another. It leads people to act out of that fear with such aggression and violence. Because we're so afraid. We want to attempt, we want to suppress and eliminate any potential threat to our own way of life to what we think belongs to us. And some of you are thinking, this is not what I came to church to hear, Pastor. But until we wrestle with that history and with that human sin, we can't begin to heal from it and move past it. What we re remember, what we realize, what we see in this Bible story is both this sin that is deeply rooted of this fear and this aggression, but also the reality that God is always on the side of the underdog. That over and over again, not just in this story, we see kind of a kernel of it in this story, but you know, zoom the camera out and look at the wider picture and we see over and over again God acting to rescue the oppressed 
and the poor and the outcast. We see this operating in this story through the bravery and resistance of ordinary and unremarkable people. Not that midwives aren't remarkable. I have used and have used. I had a midwife for both Declan and Reuben when they were born, and she was pretty amazing. Midwives had a great calling. But these were just normal women going about their lives, doing what they were gifted and skilled to do to help women bring new life to birth. And when they were put in the scary position of having the ruler of all the land call them in for this audience and tell them to be on the side of death rather than working for life, they boldly and with a shrewdness all of their own defied the Pharaoh in an act of civil disobedience. They didn't flat out tell the Pharaoh, no, we're not going to do that. They just didn't do it. And when he questioned them, they just said, oh, well, the Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women. They're strong. They're vigorous. When they go into labor, it's fast, and we can't even get there in time. And because they feared God and valued what was right and what was just over what the Pharaoh demanded and what would have likely been safest for them personally, God blessed them. We don't get much more of their story, really. We don't see how the Pharaoh reacted. We, we learn that they had family, so they survived. And it is something that the Bible chooses to tell us their names. There are so many men and women, especially, who remain anonymous in these tales. But even this little snippet of their story inspires us. Because we are reminded that our call as followers of the triune God is to stand up on the side of mercy and compassion and love. To be a force that, however subtly and shrewdly or outright boldly, works on the side of life in this world. That we are called to not be swayed by fear of those who are different than us, but to instead rise up as these midwives did, to protect and advocate for those who are vulnerable and at risk. To help bring to birth something new in this world. Rooted in our love and our respect for God and for all of God's beloved children. To help bring about God's kingdom. God's vision of dignity and worth and respect for everyone, regardless of race or ethnicity or belief system. And to work to ensure that everyone has a decent quality of life, to be building a world of harmony, not disunity, because we know that we are blessed not to hoard our blessings and protect it from others, but to be a blessing to others, because God will work through ordinary people like you and like me calling us to do what is right and just and loving so that we too may be midwives with metal who multiply and spread God's love through all the land. Amen.
Together with the whole church, let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of the Incarnate, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Confident in your abundant grace, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Empowering God, you call your church to boldly proclaim your day of salvation and to work for the protection of the vulnerable. Inspire us with courage that we may speak and embody good news to all who need to experience your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the midst of warm weather, keep us mindful of those that may be in danger of harm from high temperatures, that we might help them find relief and safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Powerful God, come to the aid of all nations and leaders who fear storms of conflict, violence, or injustice. Raise up advocates and peacemakers to speak truth and hope into the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Saving God, grant endurance and comfort to all who suffer affliction, hardship, hunger, violence, or sleepless nights of pain or anxiety. Give your promise of healing to all who long for salvation, especially Vicki, Ethel, Marge, Richard, Irv, Gloria, Krista, Carol, Mike, Irene, Dick, Chris, Stacy, Scott, Jim, and those who name silently or loudly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for all the saints who have commended themselves to you in every way and who have endured in faith, especially John the Baptist and Philip Melanchthon, renewer of the church. Bring us at last with them to the heavenly banquets that has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And always with you. Please share a sign of that peace with one another. Holy and mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all. 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. These are God's gifts for you, God's people. Please come to the feast for all this now.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. The announcements are on the insert. Today is Coins in Your Pocket Sunday, and so I invite you to share generously, and you're able to do so to help with uh, our wider community for people in need. And we are having Bible study. We're just going to do like kind of a compare and contrast of the four Gospels. So um, we're starting that today, and everyone is welcome to come. Um, there's a cartoon that I couldn't find that has, you know, like teacher, a teacher and students in the classroom, and she says, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, see me after class. Your reports are all remarkably the same. Um, and I wish I could have found it because it kind of, you know, those three, and then John. So we're going to look at how Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a little bit different, as well as how they're very different from, from John, and just kind of spend however long it takes us to walk through those um, and see some of those parallels and see some of the stories that are unique. Um, so if you've ever kind of wondered or wanted to know a little bit more about that, it's a good opportunity. Um, the new July food pantry uh, list is there, so we encourage you to do that as you can. And we are also building a toilet paper tower uh, so that we can bless people with that very necessary thing. Words escaped me. Um, but it's a necessary supply, so uh, if you're able to pick up some of that, we can kind of have the visual, visual um, gradually growing bigger. Uh, so we appreciate that as well. And then I wanted to remind you, since it's the last Sunday in June, some of you probably already picked it up, but uh, the quarterly devotional, daily devotional, uh, has been here for a while, so you may have gotten it, but if you didn't know it was here, you're welcome to grab one from out just on the previous table. I don't think there's any in the slots. Have I got your hand up? I just wanted to remind all the people that were helping with the dinner and hope that we will have a show Okay, so if you are going to help with serving dinner at the Hope Center, um, stay next week after church, just for a few minutes, just to plan what you're doing. Um, and thank you to those of that who are doing that. Um, if anyone is interested in getting back into the music scene, um, in East Troy, in the center of town, um, we're going to be having a concert with the East Troy Community Band. We're performing at 7.30, so bring a, uh, up to uh, Chairs for sitting outside and come enjoy the music. It's a lot of fun. Okay. You're always good for letting us know when the community concerts are happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about summer, pretty well anywhere you live, but especially in Wisconsin, you have the chance to be outside and hear music and be with your neighbors um, and enjoy it when it's hopefully not too hot. Oh, it's this Thursday. It's this Thursday. <laughs> okay. Um, and then next weekend, of course, uh, is leading into 4th of July, so um, if you're traveling for whatever, we you know, hope you have a good trip, and we'll see you when you come back, and if you're not, please please come, because church still happens even on Halloween weekends. So, uh, those are all of the announcements that I have, and apparently the announcements that you have, so I invite you to stand for the blessing. May God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, grant you the gifts of faith and hope. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we sing our singing song. We'll sing it a couple times through because um, it's just that one refrain. Um, it's one that gets stuck in our head, so we'll see if it gets stuck in yours.
peace, the Spirit sends us forth to serve. Thanks be to God.